Hello, everyone. Welcome. Lovely to be with you all. Um, my name is Nathan Scalaro. I'm the editor of Renew magazine. Thanks so much to Fiona and all the other participants in the last session. I'm joining you from the lands of the Woiwurrung Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations here in Melbourne's north. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past and present and the traditional owners of these lands. I also encourage you all to share uh, the lands that you're joining in from this morning in the chat. I'd love to hear where you're all at. So in this session, we're discussing the importance of designing homes for accessibility throughout all of life's changes. Um, but first, we'd like to thank our sponsors and our council partners who have made this day possible. They are the Department of Energy, Environment and Climate Action, Nat Hares, Your Home, Design for Place, Bank Australia, Sonnen, Hype v Hype, Hip v Hype, Design Matters National, and Lighthouse Architecture and Science. Before we start, I'm going to give a brief uh, overview of the homeowners who are joining us this morning. And they've provided their houses, their house profiles that can be viewed on our website with photos, house tours, uh, and de detailed sustainability credentials, I really recommend uh, you go take a look. It's incredible to see their work, their projects and homes. And you can even continue this conversation and make further inquiries in the comments section on the websites. We encourage you to have a look and we've shared links in the chat. Um, so we'll also be taking questions at the end of this session. So I encourage you to um, ask questions in the Q&A, but first I'll be asking each of our analysts a question as well. Um, so I'll begin with introductions. We are joined by Louise Gilfeder, the owner of downsized retirement ready home sitting below Kunani, also known as, hello Louise, thanks for being Hi, with us. Um, hey, also joining the discussion is Robert Goodfield, Goodwill, sorry, Robert Goodwill, and he's in Lennox, Head, Head, Lennox Heads in the Northern Rivers. Uh, Robert's home, Numbani is a low maintenance, retrofitted and productive home designed for aging. We're also joined by Kathleen Stewart, uh, who took on her designer's advice to include universal access into the design of her Brabham sustainable home. Welcome, Kathleen. Morning. And as well as these homeowners, we are joined by Marianne Jackson, who's the director of visionary design development here in Victoria. Her consultancy operates at the intersection of human needs and the built environment and believes that the best people-centered outcomes result when accessibility is continuously considered from the project outset to completion and beyond. Marianne is project director with award-winning national and international sustainability competition entries. And she's also an educator of improved accessibility and design courses. Welcome to everyone. So good to be um, having this session with you all. Um, Mary Ann, we'll start with you. Um, I'd just like to kind of start with a very general um, way into this topic. And that's uh, a question around what we actually mean when we're talking about accessibility and why this is something uh, that we should be considering when we're building a home. Hello, everybody. And thanks very much to the organizers of this session for inviting me. It's very much appreciated. So I'm fairly passionate about this area of work. So any opportunity that I've got to uh, spread the word, I'll take it. Mm -hmm. um, just a note about online accessibility to start with. I will try to speak clearly for those using captions. And for those who can't see me, I'm in my early 60s of Anglo-Saxon heritage uh, with shoulder length, wavy, um, strawberry blonde hair and brown glasses. And today I'm wearing a light blue shirt. The background behind me is actually a vista across my family's farm on the Darling Downs um, between Toowoomba and Warwick in Queensland, because although I work from Victoria and live in Melbourne, I'm actually up at the family farm at the moment, which is on the traditional lands of the Jagara, Gilbel and Jarawaya peoples. Now, going back to Nathan's actual question, um, Firstly, besides those of us that work in this arena, um, our mantra is that if it's not accessible, it's not sustainable. I'd like the viewers of this session to think about three levels of why. Firstly, at the individual level. Besides approximately 20% of the population 
um, being a person with a disability either permanently, temporarily, or episodically, um, as an individual, you never know what's around the corner. And my personal life is an example of that. My late husband and I, we used to ride motorcycles around Latin America in the Andes and things like that. And I'm a widow at 56 because um, various health issues from heart failure meant that he um, succumbed to uh, those problems, those complications. And so I have that personal experience of being a carer for someone that has um, a level of, of impairment. Also, with families, you know, the individual situation of families where children are coming along or older parents need assistance. So if our houses are designed so that that is accommodated, then that's a very good thing. And then thinking about the next level out of extended family and friends so that friends and family can visit. You know, one in three households, um, a person with a disability is in one in three households. Okay, it's not all mobility issues, but there are so many other issues that designing in an accessible way um, means that people's lives, our extended family and friends' lives are much richer if they can actually, if we can all visit each other. And then thinking about the community level, you know, if only X percent of housing is accessible, and in when I talk about accessible, I'm talking more about flexible, long life, loose fit kind of idea then people with disability and or older persons, a sizable cohort, only have choice of a small percentage of the housing market. How is that sustainable or equitable? And I'd also like to point out that all of the above equally applies to renovating alterations, additions, because statistically, you know, building a new custom designed home is less common than purchasing existing housing. So, I would just like to leave you that with those thoughts, those three levels of why, individual, family and friends, and community. Mm, fantastic. Thanks, Marianne. Louise, your home is built with retirement in mind. Uh, what did that mean to you? And what consider considerations did you make? Okay, well, um, I'll just say, start like Kathleen, I'm in my 60s, Anglo-Saxon, white-haired. <laughs> Back screens my new house of nearly two years. And um, retirement's a pretty scary stage of life, and but that's a better focus than ageing. That's something we don't want to address. But as Kathleen has said, there's a lot of reasons why accessibility is a very important focus. But I just want to concentrate firstly on one thing that my journey um, has taken me through is the social aspect. So deal with them first, which is all about your mental health and, and ageing well. Um, so my, um, my aim was to downsize, but I realised it was really important to stay in my local community. Um, I saw a lot of people retire, leave their work community, maybe move into state, new town, up the coast, new house. They lost their network, their social connectivity. Some of them spent 10 years trying to work out what they were doing, and I realised that wasn't for me. Neither was um, building a new house. I was not mad keen to build. Um, but it, because I had the option of building, subdividing my current house building, that was the pathway. Um, and I had very supportive, uh, very supportive helpful neighbours who were sustainable architects. So um, that was also very important to have that guidance. And I'd really stress that to people listening. You really, it's very important to engage a professional, architects, building designers, but yeah, uh, it's really important to get that professional help. Mm. So for me, it was important, um, I'm an ecologist, so it was important for me to be sustainable. Um, and to invest in something that had low embodied energy with no concrete, brick, aluminium, et cetera, that was a lightweight, small house, some um, 100 metres squared, so not a tiny house, small and comfortable, easy to move around, not big distances. The other important thing was um, thermal comfort, being warm, quiet, calm, serene. So um, passive solar, 8.2 stars, which is not easy in um, the temperate climate zone of Tasmania. 
and I'm op I was aiming for operationally carbon neutral, um, and now I'm actually carbon positive with about seven and a half thousand kilometres of charge from my uh, solar for charging my EV. So that's been rewarding. So that that's probably enough of some of those things. I, are we going to talk about the accessibility stuff further down, or do you want me to cover it now? Uh, yeah, we'll certainly get into it. Do you want to cover a couple of things now? In okay, yes, yeah, so I'll get yeah. it while I'm on the roll. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah go so for it. Um, yeah, design um, was very important. It wasn't just for ageing, as Kathleen's already talked, but um, I wanted things like one, one level, minimal stairs, no mezzanines. Mm -hmm. um, small footprints for that moving around the house. I want to future proof um, so that if something happened, I didn't have to spend a lot of money on trying to retrofit, which we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, so things like a walk in shower with no hob, um, no tray, uh, a stem on the shower that's already an uh, accessible grab rail. Um, that's strong enough for those sorts of things. And I put noggings everywhere for additional bath and grab rails and things should I need them, ramps, all that sort of thing. Uh, and then things just like kitchen pantry design and fridge with a crisper, things that you do reduce your bending and all that sort of thing. I've also got, um, I'm on a very steep site, but I can drive up to my back door. And if I can't walk anywhere, I could still drive into the house. Um, and the other thing is um, wide doorways, 920, which doesn't cost you very much more than just doing the normal 820, uh, but having it set up for wheelchairs, um, frame, walking frames, etc. cetera. Uh, thinking of all those things now really didn't add to the cost, but I've future-proofed. Mm -hmm. And I think the other important thing was for me was actually do it all before you're old and you won't get old. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. And, what, and just quickly, what has your experience of the home been like? Oh, absolutely delightful. But mm. the things that I stress are things like calmness, sereneness, peaceful, mm -hmm. quiet, which I think is things like the double glazing, um, the, the thermal mass of the house. But I've never lived in a warm, comfortable house in my whole life. And this is just amazing. Mm. And not only that, I've virtually got no um, power bills. And when they're talking about 25% increase in power in Tasmania, potentially in the next couple of months, yeah, I, I spend hardly anything all year and I power an electric car. Mm. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing, Louise. And it's a beautiful home as well. Thank you. Robert, we'll move to you. Um, you retrofitted your home for ageing in place. Uh, tell us a bit about what that entailed for you. Yes. Uh, hi. So it's Robert um, from Lennox Head. Uh, this is the subtropical northern rivers of far north New South Wales. Um, and today, at the moment, I'm actually still on Bundjalung country in the Arakwa, where the Arakwa people are. Um, so, yeah, I've done a number of um, house uh, renovations and never done a, a, a full build. Um, the... Uh, housing stock in our area is um, quite a mixture with a, uh, the bulk of it being probably built in the 80s and 90s. Um, I wanted to do a, a full build and um, it just uh, wasn't, there was nothing available at a, at a small size or it wasn't on a, on a massive slope. So in the end, um, we found a uh, project home, um, which suited all the criteria for um, a, a long-lasting home. So it's it's uh, uh, and I've learned the hard way by um, uh, and I guess I think also um, learned the hard way and also by being um, accommodating a mother-in-law who was in a wheelchair. So um, we. Uh, we moved actually in Sydney Olympic Park, we moved into a house that was perfect for her. So I learned some lessons uh, in over the years. Um, then back to the Northern Rivers. Um, and the, so this, this house was perfect in many ways. It's the, um, the retrofit story is covered in the, um, 
the YouTube, which is now supported by um, a Renew. And I'll just mention that um, I started off my project with some very good technical advice from Renew. I've been a member of, with Renew for probably 10 years or more. So um, I think that was with Lance Turner and he was particularly telling me, um, forget about evacuated tubes, go for um, mm. uh, modern heat pumps for hot water. Uh, anyway, the, um, the house is uh, um, fairly, it has no steps up into the front door. There's only one step up into the house. Um, the block is north facing. Um, it was perfect for retrofitting and it, I've now turned it into a zero emission all electric um, home that also supplies the my own energy for the car and it's a, a net exporter of power. Um, mm -hmm. All fairly easily done with the right componentry and the right um, installer and the initial advice from Renew. So um, that's it in a, in a nutshell. It, it's now a productive food garden. Um, that, and um, I'm just swatting some mosquitoes here. Um, yeah, that's right. with, <laughs> um, so the, the detail is available on, on the film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, one one of your previous, um, uh, I think it was uh, Mary mentioned the the door, the front entrance door is also very wide. It's uh, over a meter. Um, the the basic structure of the house, the design, in terms of passive solar, was all pretty good, and it was selected carefully on on that. With a with a decision criteria before we bought it, having mm -hmm. given up the idea of a of a greenfield build. Um, so is that I can go into more detail or how does that? Yeah, no, that's fantastic. It's yeah, no, that's very really useful. Thanks, Robert, and it's great to hear you got so much uh, advice from Renew Magazine. I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah, um, I did want to. Um, Ask you mentioned you learned a lot of lessons with your um, aging living with your aging mother in law. Are there any specific lessons you might be able to share now that you've applied one or two? Yeah, well, uh, so we we um, we had a sort of major life change living in Sydney, working in Sydney. Then we moved to Sydney Olympic Park, and mm -hmm. we moved into the X. Um, we bought one of the X uh, two thousand Sydney Olympic. Uh, village ha homes and they were all solar powered um, and it was a, that was a gr you know a green vision but uh, this um, house was on uh, a around four different levels it was very clever use of of space capture but it was all going upwards mm -hmm. and it was on multiple levels it was um, so my mother-in-law moved in and she literally couldn't access any of the levels apart from uh, <clears throat> the sort of uh, lounge kitchen area and one room which we turned into her bedroom. So then we moved into a, uh, and bought another house which was um, all, all completely flat block. Again, one step up into the house uh, wide uh, wide door frames, wide sliding windows, uh, everything accessible. And, and that really sort of, I guess that was the learning process from the, from the, the, the clever, but bad for, bad for anyone with disability and not bad for your future mm -hmm. into a, a flat uh, bungalow. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, that that's yeah, it, um, absence of stairs essentially, mm. um, and and different levels, yeah. uh, which which means which means a, a flat flat block, and a flat um, bungalow single level dwelling. Mm. Great, thanks, Robert. Mm. So accessibility in the home is not only about aging. We know that one in five people uh, in Australia experience some kind of disability. 
So we're going to hear from Kathleen now. And Kathleen, I wonder if you can speak to what some of the considerations that can be made to make homes as accessible as possible and why it's important to think about even if no residents currently experience disability. G'day everyone. Um, so I'm in Perth on Wajak Noonga country here. Um, I, I wanted to start with um, really why, why it's important and uh, my, my own experience um, a couple of years ago now when I was 37 uh, it was within a week after moving into the new build, um, which I'm currently in, uh, which had wonderful advice about universal design. I found myself, I found myself. Uh, six months on and off in different mobility devices, including wheelchair, crutches, uh, um, shower chair, you, you name it, you think of it, this is what I was in. Um, so why it's important, I think, it, universal design isn't just about catering for long-term or permanent disability. All of us at some time in our lives, um, and no matter if you think it's going to be you or not, if you play sport, <laughs> soccer, you might have a broken ankle or a sprained ankle. Um, those of us um, who have children, um, you might have experienced carpal tunnel in your arm or even tendonitis. All of these things, as they come and go, um, a, an accessible home or some basic universal design principles can come in great, great use. Um, so I, that, that's why it's important. And the other thing I wanted to um, raise as well is that there's a, there's a perception uh, that accessibility and universal design is really a privilege with people for people who have some money to, to spend on it but it doesn't need to be expensive at, at all um where we built it is it is in your typical um urban suburban development small block um in the uh, suburban sprawl so certainly not um in a city and certainly didn't um, come into this with with a lot of money um but the wider wider doors is uh, doorways, as mentioned by um, some of our other panellists, really, really easy and really, really um, important. Um, I've had the occasion where ambulances had to come to the house and a stretcher come in, and um, those things have made have made a really big difference. Um, it's really simple things like uh, having a lever on your tap rather than a twist um, for, you know, those those times where we are patting our baby's bottoms and we get tendonitis, you can still turn the tap on and off. Um, for my own situation, um, for those six or so months um, in really, really difficult times, having, having a home with wider doorways and with a shower that I could wheel myself into meant that I could have dignity in my in my house. I didn't need to have someone um, come in and help. My partner could still go to work. My kids, I could still live with them and they could still go to school and I didn't have to have anyone come stay with me. Or the other way is I didn't have to go stay anywhere else. That's really, really important and um, it was these small things that uh, we put into the home and you know it's basically a house and land package type home that we made some changes to that made all the difference. Mm. How quick how quickly were you able to make those changes to the home? Um... Oh well um, it was um, basically it was thought of at the beginning and um, really, you know, naively, my, my priority when, when I um, approached this uh, particular designer was I want a shower that's easy to clean. You know, I've, I've lived in all these places with these showers and they got lots of hinges and doors and steps up and the, the mould and, you know, that was something I just wanted easy to clean. So I saw these, you know, wonderful hobbler showers. I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. there's so much less surface and corners to clean. And that's when, you know, the designer was telling me about, okay, well, yes, that, that's, that's a great part of this. But then he started saying, this is going to give you um, a, a lifelong home accessibility and it doesn't, doesn't really, it doesn't really cost more. 
The, the one thing I found really interesting before going to my particular uh, designer was um, seeing a lot of the other um, project builders and talking to them about universal design. And, you know, this was a few years ago, maybe five years ago, but the but but the blank the blank looks and the and and the oh you well, know you could do it this way or you know it'll cost this much it, it was that there was really not a lot of knowledge um, and I think that's important um, to to bring up as well as to is to make sure that you know you're speaking to people who have the knowledge because the the engineering of a flush threshold it's not. Uh, I say it's it's not that hard for someone who knows what they're doing. They just need to draw it that way. But for people who don't have the expertise, it's just and project builders in, in particular, and they do great things in some spaces. Don't, don't get me wrong, but without that um, knowledge, there you're just not going to get the suggestions. Mm -hmm. Great. I might invite you, Marianne, just to tell us a bit more about universal design. I'm sure you could all speak to it, but it might be valuable just for us to hear. Um, well, that is yeah. and... sorry, the the textbook Universal Design, the Seven Principles of Universal Design, and there's more recent um, Eight Goals of Universal Design. Um, I'm not, I don't work with Universal Design as such, um, because for me it's kind of common sense. Um, but what I do think is that the principles of universal design are a great starting point. And so the fact that they exist is helpful in the architectural education space um, because that means that we've got a starting point to start skilling people up. But, um, I mean, the idea of universal design is obviously straightforward, that we should be designing for, you know, better to accommodate more people for more of the time. I mean, I could go on about a whole lot of um, research and academic stuff about <laughs> universal yeah. design, but I, yeah. but I don't think that's um, appropriate. But yeah. what I was going to pick yeah. up on some of the things that Kathleen said yeah. was about the dignity aspect mm -hmm. of things. And my take or my expertise and experience in being in this space has made me a much better designer. It's made me much more aware of how houses should work and how you can design them to work. Because thinking about the dignity aspect, we do a lot of work with the NDIA, the National Disability Insurance Agency. And one little project that we've got at the moment, the NDIA won't fund an adult change table in the modified bathroom they are saying that the participant who is in who's a teenager and who lives in a house of boys um it's okay if she's stripped down for her bath in her bedroom and then put in a toweling robe and taken into the bathroom and that is a dignity issue but if the house was designed slightly differently so that the public spaces and the private spaces are separate and you can go about your private things in the private space without having to um, interact with the public areas of the house that would be a much better design and that would make for dignity as well mm -hmm. i love this framing of dignity in you know for, for everyone who's entering the house it's kind of being the key consideration um so there are a lot of misconceptions about um, uh, designing for accessibility, and I think you've all illuminated um, what some of uh, what it actually means. But I, I wonder if we can go a little deeper. So it's not just the kind of ramps and railings; it can be also really quite subtle as having kind of a kitchen, bathroom, bedroom all on the ground floor. Um, I will invite this question to all of you: some of the common misconceptions um, about what it what it is. But Marianne, maybe you would want to start with this question. Well, I can actually give you a bit of an anecdote. Yeah, um, one yeah. of my neighbours in our street, uh, yes, they're an older couple, um, Mary and Leo. Mary's profoundly deaf and she's had, you know, hearing issues all her life. When they built their new house, um, it's a two-storey house, but to accommodate um, her deafness and to make it easier for her to live in, the sorts of things that she organised with her designer were that there's parquetry flooring, and so it's a smaller um, 
what's the, a smaller unit rather than having great big tiles. Mm. In the open plan living dining kitchen area, although the floor plan is fairly open, there's actually um, lowered sections in the ceilings in the ceiling so that that creates baffles. And there's also a nook off to the side of the living the open plan living area where you can retreat into a more quiet space. Mm. And they've also co-located a lift with the stairs, which, you know, if if they weren't older, <laughs> they might have just put in cupboards in that space to start with and, and put a lift in later. And so that's not from a mobility, accessibility, ramps, rails, anything like that. That's from a hearing um, mm. issue perspective. So I think that's really important to remember that when we talk about accessibility, it's kind of shorthand and it gets people interested, but it's much, much wider than just the physical ramps and rails issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Louise, did you discover anything um, beyond what you've already shared in the process of developing your home, designing your home around what accessibility actually means? Were you surprised uh, the deeper you kind of got into the process? Um, <laughs> yes and no. Uh, one of my, uh, one thing was about being flexible um, because um, whilst I, like uh, Robert, didn't want any steps, I wanted to, that was my aim, but we hit bedrock. It was going to cost an awful lot, of, like 25% more cost to um, the whole thing to um, excavate all of that. So one thing was compromised. So um, mm. I've now got one step up. It's a big wide platform with provision for a ramp. Um, but it was sort of like being flexible as those bounce with the, the challenges and then um, deal with them. And uh, interestingly enough, I, I don't need, I don't have any need at the moment for access ramps, but my old dog does. So we've gone ahead and done that. Right, yeah. <laughs> He's first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and the um, Mary Ann touched on it um, as well. Is the ease of cleaning and things has been wonderful mm. for some of have some of the accessibility things do make it for a much less cluttered, easier to deal with uh, house. Mm. I'd actually also love to hear if there are things now that you're living in the home that you'd like to do to make it more accessible that you're seeing could be done. I wonder, Robert or um, Kathleen, if anything comes to mind on that. Or have you perfected it? Robert? Um, I, yes, I, I, I think we've done everything that could be done in terms of... Um, accessibility uh, i tell the what the one one uh factor has emerged which um and that's more to do with the the kitchen garden and the um the i, I used uh crushed um basalt rock around the perimeter of the house so that it the rain would just flow through the, the rock um, and it, it, it is uh, difficult to push any kind of wheelbarrow over it. Um, so I probably should have put, put, his, put in basalt stepping stones there um, and that, that could, that'll become more of a problem late, later. So when uh, I guess the overriding design principle or retrofit principle is is think think ahead as to your um your mobility and your it's not just mobility it's things like strength um in 10 am i i'm only 68 or <laughs> um but in 10 years time it could be different and i'm i'm the lifespan of this house really is from our late 60s till um, were Quisha um, Kabisa, as we say in Swahili, were gone. Um, so yeah, small, just that's a small aspect that was overlooked. Mm. And mm. Uh, an another thing was um, the, I think amongst the 
you won't get this advice from your typical um, or your standard project home builder. And uh, you will get it from a, an architect um, and po possibly some um, good, good designers. Uh, but yeah, a lot, a lot of, um, and you probably will get it from a, you, you might get it from a, uh, we, we, we did have, we've been on permaculture courses, um, but they even, they tend not to, they don't think too much about the, ex, uh, well, the accessibility of the, of the, um, of the garden beds, except that a raised garden bed around a meter and just over a meter in height is ideal because you're not doing a lot of bending and mm. um so that there is some some knowledge and awareness but it's not that deep and not that widely practiced in, in this region right yeah i can add to rivers. that yeah mm. um sure. i i totally I, I totally agree with that in terms of um the thought of what is outside the home versus designing designing the home and with the home design that a lot of thought you know would go in well the access to the front door and then and then the and then the outdoor but there are other things that we do at home um, and particularly if you think about how often we need to do washing and especially on these um small small blocks like what I'm what I mean in this, um, you know, a development and everything is we're all stacked on top of each other. What about the clothesline and how 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 do we make that accessible for all strengths and heights and um, and, and ability levels? And a lot of the time, um, it, these things aren't um, included. A if you're doing a house, uh, you know, house and land package, what's on the outside? Your letterbox. That's another thing. How do we make that accessible? And not just to the postie, to us as well. Um, and your clothesline, it's it's not in that. It's left to you as a builder to think about afterwards and go, oh, <laughs> oh, there's no room on the outside for that because we're all stacked up. And where and how to do it? And do we do something inside the house? Do our utility rooms, do they need to get wider and bigger and um, a bit more clever in terms of how we can um, get these things in the house as well? Mm. Robert, I would like to pick up on things that Kathleen and Robert have said. Um, actually, Nathan, sorry. Nathan, I'd like to pick up on things that Kathleen and Robert have said. Um, I'm really interested in that beyond the home itself. Um, my research um, interests are around accessibility at neighbourhood scale. Obviously, on a day-to-day -day basis with the NDIA work I do, it is mainly bathrooms. And that's the conventional kind of received wisdom about accessibility, that it's all about an accessible bathroom. But both Robert mm. and Kathleen have just so um, ably put up about it's all connected. And so we actually want to make our houses work with our surroundings, with the community. Mm. And we need to make sure that those transitions, that the interfaces between those things work as well. Mm, fantastic. Thanks for that. Can I, I just add a little bit to that too, Nathan? Well, well, yeah, we're going to move into audience questions, but yeah, quickly. <laughs> okay, I was just going to say, um, same thing, should have got a landscape architect because I didn't uh, look at the paving, the mm. outside, the access, really mm. big learning curve in there, and I'm just dealing with that now, and I'd really stress that because mm. the architect, everything finishes at the boundary, mm. but mm. it's the yeah. whole Can yeah. I just, I, I'll just say what, what Louise said, it, it um we found it incredibly difficult to get any kind of uh, landscape architectural uh, blended with permaculture uh, advice, even though there's a lot of permaculture practice in the Northern Rivers. It, it just was not available. Interesting. Okay. Mm. There's an invitation there for landscape architects. Renew is a non-profit membership organisation. Along with running Sustainable House Day, we also inform government policy, advocate for a fair energy transition, provide resources for climate disaster resilience, and publish two magazines. Sanctuary Magazine provides trusted independent information for people looking to build or innovate sustainably. Renew Magazine is a leading voice on sustainable technology developments shaping the energy transition. 
These magazines grew from member newsletters in the 1980s and still maintain their grassroots independence and practical approach. Both are incredible resources and subscribing is a great way to support us to transform Australian homes for climate and energy resilience. Um, all right, so we'll move into some questions now. There's a few here and um, they're not um, fired to one in particular. So whoever wants to jump to the question, to, to answer the question is great. Uh, from Jenny, what are some of the predominant things I should keep in mind when designing my new build for accessibility? Do I need to consult an architect that specializes in accessible design? Um, hopefully you've heard a few great ideas. I feel like we can make an awesome resource from everything that's coming out of this chat, uh, from this conversation and in the chat as well. So we might look at doing that, but is there anything else anyone wants to add? Predominant things to keep in mind when decide, designing the new build for accessibility. Um, do, does Jenny consult an architect that specializes in accessible design? Well, I think I'll jump in seeing I'm an architect. <laughs> of course. But no, um, people that know what they're doing, you need to be working with people that know what they're doing. But mm. from your own perspective, make sure that your plan is logical and legible. And so that the circulation is very straightforward. Um, the, the public and the private are separated. So that you've got these basic kind of you know, backbone to build upon. Can I just say, I think all, all architects would um, be, uh, would, would, would have the knowledge and the practice around uh, design for aging. Um, and that should be part of your brief to them and your, your brief criteria. Thanks, Robert. Any other reflections on that question before we move on? Great. Um, okay, we have one here from Lisa. For accessibility, um, Lisa's wondering if double glazing creates any access problems given the extra weight of the glazing involved when opening sliding glazed doors or opening windows for ventilation. Is it a trade-off of thermal comfort for ease of using the glazed areas? I actually answered that in the- Oh, uh, did you? Yeah, yeah because yeah, it's yeah. actually a serious issue and I didn't think about it and I've got these doors that I can just move now. Mm. But if I get a bit mm. frailer, uh, but luckily I have another access point, but I think it's a very serious, probably under-considered issue. And if you had triple glaze, which is starting to become mm. popular, mm. I don't know how you'd shift them. So I, it's a very important thing to include in the uh, design concepts in the beginning because yeah, it's very easy to and you can see from my picture behind have those big you know full length doors they're really heavy and hard to move but would you still um go ahead with it is the trade-off the ease oh i think so but make sure luckily for me i've got a door next door that um i've got two access right. points yeah. so yeah. i can avoid them and not even open them and just use the ventilation of tilt and turn windows which was another part of my answer uh, mm. because they're very manageable. Uh, the other thing is also um, the height of some of the turns, because I'm quite short, and I've got some bifold windows to get the ventilation, but I must need to climb up on a step ladder to open my bifolds, because we didn't, nobody mm. thought about putting a handle down, two thirds down where I could reach it. It's too mm. late. Mm. I'm, I'm really interested in what Louise just said, mm. because yes, Things don't um, improve logically and um, linear, in a linear fashion. They tend to um, improve in different ways. And so that's a fabrication, a manufacturer's catch-up point where mm. they need to actually design easy doors that are more easily operated because that's to do with the tracks and how the doors are set mm. up. Mm. Great. Um, Georgina is asking, is there a certification or way of identifying designers, architects and builders who practice these principles so that we can locate them? Does anyone know about that? Certification or way of identifying? Um, okay. Principles? Um, yeah. Yes. Thanks. I'm a um, accredited access consultant. I'm a registered architect. I'm also an accredited access consultant. 
and I'm also a, an accredited livable housing assessor. And so with those certifications, that would suggest that um, or people that have those certifications should have more understanding of this arena. Um, but And there's passive house um, accreditation as well. But as far as I'm aware, in Australia at the moment, there's no accessible designer certification in itself. But if you seek out architects or building designers that have um, additional qualifications in the access consulting or livable housing or passive housing or something like that, um, you should have some success. And if I can add to that, um, when you're talking to different organise organisations and people, um, getting their portfolio or examples of, of what they've done in the past is, is really, I think is a really good thing because um, it, when I was first, uh, when I was first looking um, and past project builders, there are some options available, but um, going from the really, really high high end to the to the what um, you know I could really afford, f figuring that out was 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 really was really difficult um, because at, at first look, when you first when you first going into it, you think, oh, okay, there isn't an option for me. But there is, and just just ask for just ask for some examples. Yeah, great. Thanks, Kathleen. Kathy C has a question here. Um, maybe we'll stay with you, Kathleen. She says, "I know we would want to aim for maximum accessibility, but if we had to choose, what are the most essential inclusions?" Yeah. Okay. Um, that is a that's a really 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 great, great question because there's so many more things that I would have been able to love um, to do to to the house and you know there's limitations on block size mm. and etc. Um, width so this is width of hallways and um, width of width of doors um, is really really I think that one of the most important things and I think especially when you're looking at um, um, your, your project builders, what you see a lot now um, is toilet doors that are 60 centimetres or 600 mil wide. That's really, really hard. That's that's really, really hard for people of different, um, if people different shapes and sizes who don't have mobility issues, but it's really, really common and something which um, is, is not highlighted to you as a consumer going, oh, hey, look at all these narrow spaces. You have to sort of figure that out for, for yourself. So um, de decent widths and um, a minimum of 89 centimetres uh, wide for, for your doorways is really, really important. The other thing which um, is um, really, really not, not expensive at all to do is the uh, taps that the water taps getting something that that is a lever and appropriate um, that you know you, you don't have to twist two two really really big things um, the hobbler showers absolutely um, amazing but I will say that there are some um, if, even in the project builder space that aren't completely hobbless they they've gone down to a small little lip which is still better than a big a big step down mm, great thanks Kathleen. Um, Robert, Marianne, Louise, do you want to throw anything else in there for the most essential inclusions? I could uh, make a comment. Yeah. It, depend, it depends on where you're starting from. If you're starting with a complete new build, as I was saying, I think that um, the starting point is to make sure that the circulation is logical and legible. And Kathleen, what Kathleen's saying, um, about the corridors, because if we've got good circulation to, st to start with, then we'll um, mitigate most of those problems. But yes, everything else that Kathleen said, but yeah, depending on your starting point, just think about how you can place things so that if in the future you do need to do further um, modifications, they can be easily done. So that if I would prefer to have the toilet, the toilet pan in a bathroom, but some people want still want them separate. But if you do that, make sure that the toilet is beside the bathroom with no obstructions on that wall in between so that you can easily take that wall out. So just think about designing in such a way, laying things out in such a way that flexibly you can do things later if you need to. Right. Uh, I, I think I'd 
um, say, if you're looking at uh, site, site selection um, and avoiding sites that are very steep uh, so that uh, with a lot of earthworks, which is what goes on a lot around our area, um, you, you ideally want your floor plan to, to sit on a, you know, a, a flat area rather than starting to, to, to build up and creating different levels. And um, the, house, the first house we bought at Sydney Olympic Park, Newington, was um, uh, the actual uh, ground, uh, ground size, the block was probably something like uh, 200 or 300 uh, square meters, but they captured the space by building, building up uh, cleverly, but um, no use for mother-in-law who um, was walking on a frame. And we, we never considered that. Mm. when we bought it. Mm. That is one of the questions I might take this as the final question. Um, someone has asked, Liz has asked, just wondering how we weigh up the concept of one level with minimum footprint on the soil. And she says, first thing I think of, of course, is to reduce the house, uh, the size of the house. Um, but I wonder if anything else comes to mind for anyone, how we weigh up this concept of one, one level with minimum footprint. I would actually like to respond to that yeah, because even though we've been talking about accessibility and we've been talking about the benefits of single level, um, it also needs to be balanced against the fact that the incidence of full-time wheelchair use is actually pretty low. And so therefore we shouldn't not have stairs in buildings necessarily, but when we do, we need to make sure that they are designed correctly and fully featured with adequate um, treads, you know, not too high in the risers, adequate width, handrails on both sides, please, and yeah. extensions at the bottom and the top and space to move at the bottom and the top. So that if you actually have fully featured accessible stairs, that will go a long way towards mitigating access issues with having a multi-level property. But mm. Most designers, most houses are built with just thinking about the stairs themselves. And so we have these ridiculously small treads and really mm. steep rises and no handrails and bay are, is what is the problem, not fully featured, properly designed, accessible stairs. Mm. Great. An issue which um, my designer uh, brought up when we were looking at my block size because I, I had these lofty ideas of having this um, wonderful loft to have a view out over the hills. Mm. Um, and of course, it, it costs a bit more to build up. But um, he's, you know, he was telling me that look, if it's something you do, it's not a huge issue. We just make the stairs wide enough so, in the event in the future that a, a chair uh, lift uh, that really? attaches to the side, yeah, yeah, that's it. Can 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 go up. And he said mm. he was talking about how basically easy that is to to fit in, just as long as you get the stairs right in the first place wide enough and um you know steep enough and whatever the specs were obviously we we went for a one level uh in the end but um it didn't occur to me at that stage that how easy that could be as long as it was done right at the beginning with the stairs yeah fantastic unfortunately we've run out of time thank you um for all the questions and thank you most importantly to our panelists for their wonderful responses like i said there's such a valuable resource of information there that i hope we're able to capture um, and share more broadly. Um, yeah, special thanks to Robert, Kathleen, Marianne, and Louise um, for being part of this and for sharing. Um, stick around, everyone, for the next session, which is all about prefab and modular homes. It's going to be hosted by a Sanctuary editor, Anna Cumming. And don't forget that we're running a month of online extension sessions starting next week, offering a further deep dive into eight key areas of sustainable design. And you can check out the full program via the link in the chat. And finally, we encourage you to make a donation. Um, all of today's events are free, but if everyone who attended donated just $10, it will go a long way in supporting Renew to tr transform Australia's homes for climate and energy resilience. Um, thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining and uh, hope you have a great sustainable house day.